and Sindroro Unios and Kir Persis. Three, two, one, action! John's rebirth was a really big thing. I knew it was going to be a big thing for the audience. It was a big thing to shoot. It's not a fate to complete before we start with it. It's Davos going in and persuading or requesting that Melisandre try and do something. There's certainly nothing to lose at this point. And uh, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. I think for Melisandre's part, if she could do this thing, it would somehow serve as some small justification for all the horror that she's precipitated. I don't think Melisandre thinks she can do anything. She's completely defeated. She's completely lost it. She's completely confused. And to see her hit rock bottom and to really have her big crisis of faith that maybe she's not favored by the Lord of Light. She only has the powers that he grants her. You know, you think when Melisandre comes in, okay, well, she's gonna do it and that's gonna be the end of it. But, you know, she comes in, she does it and she fails and we think that she's failed. And then everybody leaves the room and then the moment happens and we see that in fact she hasn't failed. So I think that surprise is really great. For me as a filmmaker, building that in, that tension, anticipation, feeling of failure that's not gonna work and then, oh, it did work. All of that, how to build that, it was very interesting to me. So, Kip, okay, yeah. we'll do another one a little smaller. A little smaller, okay. Yeah, same vibe, but... Yeah. Okay. You know, we tried a, a few different things. I mean, it was always my feeling that, you know, coming back to life, it should be like he's taking this huge breath. It's almost like coming up from underwater. <clears throat> the thing it's most reminiscent of is birth, and, and the reaction of a infant upon being born is not, you know, smiles and laughter. It's It's screaming and bawling and what is this place i was so warm and comfortable and everything was peaceful and now you've pulled me into the cold bright world and now who knows what's going to happen <gasps> short fight, the Stormy and Castle Black. It took quite a few days to get it right. It's, it's, it's amazingly complex. Castle Black is always a challenging location, but a, a great one at the same time. Bang! Bang! Frost! Joints coming in! And it's partly because you're dealing with a lot of elements, you know, snow and extras, and in this case, 1-1. One, one. Once you come in, all the enemy above the cameras here and over here, okay? All right, here you go. Fortunately for us, shooting 1-1 one -one is, a, is a, a really joyful experience because of the suit performer, Ian White, who plays 1-1. One -one. Action! We wanted a large performer because somebody who would be 14 feet tall would have more weight and mass to move around, and a person who's a normal size would have a very difficult time pulling that off. Ian, don't forget not to come this way and then go around into it. So working with someone who is seven foot two, who with his makeup on goes up another few inches, and then is also an actor, and is also a physical performer, puts us in a very good spot. <laughs> we do that again. First, we get storyboards from the director, or, or he gives us a verbal direction. Uh, and then we uh, go into uh, previs, and uh, we uh, work out uh, cameras and animations. Then we show it to the director, he gives us notes on it. Then we show it to Dan and David, and uh, they give us notes on it. And then we have a, a good animatic version of, of that final shot. You know, obviously it looks like a video game, but we know what we're going for and how we want it to uh, look at the end of the day. My favorite scene of the, of the season this year for me has been the aging of Melisandre. It was really beautifully shot. We had Carice in her prosthetic makeup 
who they would they would shoot her performance, but then they would shoot it with her double Sheila, who was this elderly lady who would do exactly the same motions as, as Carice. And we're also seeing her facing the reality of, of who and what she really is, which is somebody who is not young and beautiful, but with somebody who's been here for a very, very long time. Her appearance is a lie, uh, just as the Lord of Light's supposed promises to her and messages to her were lies, or at least not what she thought they were. That was a tough one. That was my last day of shooting, actually. And I think for uh, uh, Patrick and Pilu, the two actors, Balon and Euron, it was a tough one. Let me pass. You know, we were shooting outside in November in Belfast at night, all night long, in, you know, lashing rain um, on the set that's, I don't know, 15 feet off the ground and green screen. I heard you lost your mind during a storm on the Jade Sea. Every time I send them out there for another take, I was like, oh. <laughs> I am the storm, brother. Kind of sets its own scene because it's described as a rope bridge between two towers of pike. So you basically, you need one tower, another tower, a rope bridge joining. What we had to bring to it was, was an awful lot. The bridge had to be secured. It had to be safe enough to have actors working on there, to have people being thrown off there for a camera crew to work in amongst it. It needed rain, it needed wind, it needed lights. There was a lot of equipment that needs to go around this thing. You know, it's a really great scene. I think they knew it was gonna be a great scene, so they were excited about that, but yeah, it was challenging. Camera, action. Seeing a dragon for the first time, he's always thought that they were just legend. And he's always had a, an obsession. In this season, we get to explore that even more because now he has proof. And now he's, he's, his curiosity is, is too great not to uh, find out more and see him again firsthand. I'm friends with your mother. Well, Dragon Daycare was a little daunting because last season we were in Croatia and we were shooting in this amazing location, the Diocletian Palace in Split. And it is this like huge vaulted room with pillars and it's a stunning location and a fantastic place for the dragons to be held. And when I found it this year that I had an equally complex sequence but we're not actually at the location, I thought, well, how is that even gonna be possible? And then <laughs> to the rescue comes Deb Riley, the production designer and the VFX department and then some good storyboarding and planning and, and we made it work. And it, the sequence, I think, is fantastic. I really, really love it. I'm here to help. And amazingly, I don't think anyone would ever know that we weren't back in that location. Don't eat the help. So the area in Split, that had been well surveyed. So we had, the, we had drawings of what was in Split. We had drawings of the stairs that we had to put in. So we had all the elements. We had a space here. And then again, working with visual effects, you know, how much do we build? I think we deemed that 15 foot was a good cutoff for us, and then visual effects were able to carry on after that. I think it really helps the scene in a way because it forces you into more darkness. It's a mystery exactly what it is you're going to be facing, or the fact that it's really just a couple of pillars and a, a maybe a wall or two, and the rest of it's entirely done with visual effects. It makes it easier to play up the darkness, which in turn, I think, really improves the scene on a tonal level. That one? Yeah. Oh, right. With something like this, there's very little improv when you're shooting. You know, it's, you really, really design it and you plan it. The only thing that really is kind of like unplanned is the performance in a way. And so with Peter, it was really about um, really kind of talking through what this moment means for him because, you know, we know that Tyrion's been fascinated by dragons his entire life. So there's a kind of magical quality for him. But that's mixed with a lot of other things. It's awe, it's fear, it's sympathy, it's nostalgia, it's like it's a million things. But Peter is so great and the scene is so beautiful. I mean it's just it's he's a kid in the candy store. It's terrifying. I mean the fact that he could die at any moment. Um, but it, it's just it's too great of an opportunity for him. To miss. And my father told me the last dragon had died a century ago. I cried myself to sleep that night. 
they also have this kind of like almost human emotive quality, which I think comes as a surprise to him. And I think he's just amazed by this kind of awareness and knowingness and sensitivity that the dragons actually have. And then there's the added thing too in this particular scene because the dragons are a little unwell. And so there's a kind of pathos in this whole situation. This is a beautiful, incredible beast, potentially incredibly powerful, but they are now diminished because they've been held in captivity and haven't been treated properly.